Hello, everyone. This is Sherry Greenhouse, Managing Partner of CRM Exchange, and I'd like to welcome you to today's Technology Showcase. Get the whole story by capturing the whole call presented by Evoke Analytics. We are recording this demo, and we'll make sure you do get a link to that recording. It will probably, probably be on Monday, so Monday afternoon you will have that link. We're going to set up a scenario for you, go through a demo, and at the end of the demo, we're going to have a Q&A. So if you have any questions, what you will do is put them in the Q&A section, which is on the lower right-hand side, and we'll pick up those questions right after the demo. Your presenter today, Joe Alwyn, is VP and GM of Evoke Analytics at Raytheon BBN Technologies. Based on 30 years of research and practice, companies select Evoke Analytics to optimize customer effort, revenue, and cost efficiency. Joe was previously VP GM of Call Center Solutions at Empirix and has 25 years of experience turning technology innovation into practical business solutions. It's now my pleasure to turn this technology showcase over to Joe. Thank you, Sherry, and thank you, everybody, for joining us on a Friday, uh, I guess, noon here, uh, morning in other parts of the country. Um, so to start our demo, what we'd like to do is uh, introduce a bit of a, sh a scenario, hopefully a scenario that uh, is um, you know, familiar to some of you or sort of relevant to the uh, challenges and issues you're dealing with. And we'll use this scenario then to kind of um, illustrate how the Evoke Call Browser, how our solution works, and how it can bring value to you and your organization. So the uh, setting for the demo is uh, two things have happened. Uh, the IVR team has been told that they must increase self-service. And uh, where did this come from? Well, you know, this can come from a variety of things. Um, we're just starting 2013, and uh, many contact centers have specific goals and objectives now to reduce uh, agent-handled call volume. Uh, that can certainly be a driver. Um, and sometimes feedback from supervisors can really uh, motivate this kind of, a, uh, this kind of an initiative. Um, for example, supervisors uh, saying that their teams are getting a lot of calls for transactions that are in the IVR. And so, you know, their view is, why am I getting calls for a balance and uh, simple transactions that are in the IVR? Why aren't these calls self-serving? Um, uh, and, of course, the other feedback we can get from the contact center is, uh, how come we don't add these other transactions to the IVR? So a variety of things can drive this sort of initiative, this need, this objective um, to figure out how can we increase uh, self-service in the IVR. Another uh, big initiative that uh, we see, a popular initiative we see, are uh, programs and efforts to increase customer satisfaction scores or net promoter scores. Um, so uh, very important initiatives in many companies, uh, and uh, they, these come from a few places. Uh, maybe the scores aren't where we want them, uh, or perhaps they're verbatims um, in the surveys that are specifically citing um, the IVR and saying, look, you know, I really had a hard time with the IVR, didn't like the IVR, um, or agents, uh, which we're actually going to see in the demo, are, are being impacted by the experience in the IVR. And because of the IVR experience, it complicates and adds complexity and adds time to the agent's work to handle the call. So that's the scenario, or two scenarios. So let's say you are the recipient of one of these two goals from your leadership and your organization, and uh, here then is sort of the insights um, somehow you're going to have to get. If we're going to answer this question about how uh, to drive self-service, we first need to answer, uh, well, well, how many calls are – uh, avoiding or not using self-service. I mean, how many calls for self-servable transactions don't even attempt or get to the self-service module in the IVR and somehow bypass that intended path and get to the agents? And why does that happen? That's item A here on this, uh, on this picture, uh, on this chart. Item B, for those that actually get into the self-service module, um, why do they fail out? How come they don't complete? Uh, what's going on there? Um, and if we're going to add new transactions uh, to the IVR, what transactions would they be? And uh, what would the business case be? How many, how many calls might actually use them? Would that pay for the investment to uh, add the application to the IVR? And finally, uh, we, some, you know, if we're going to answer the question about improving survey scores, uh, we have to figure out uh, why and where our customers getting frustrated. Where, where do they feel like it's just too much work? Um, what is it about the IVR that's a, that's a negative experience? So 
Um, so here's, you know, the challenge you have. You've been given one of these or both of these initiatives, reduce call volume and improve satisfaction in the IVR, and uh, somehow you've got to get this data. Uh, what we're going to do today um, is uh, we, we certainly don't have time to kind of walk through all four of these scenarios, so we're going to pick the second one, this one about trying to learn why calls fail out of self-service. We'll use that as kind of a uh, focus for the demo, and as you'll discover um, along the way, we're going to learn a lot about uh, customers getting frustrated inside the IVR. So let's talk a little bit more about how you might tackle uh, this, this, you know, this little insight you need about why customers are failing out of self-service. Well, this might look like a fairly, you know, standard kind of little work plan. You know, you've got to put a, put a project together to figure this out. Um, the first thing you might do is go get a list of calls that have self-service failures. Um, and maybe pick a set of those, perhaps 25, and say, all right, let me drill into 25 examples of calls that started but didn't finish self-service, and uh, let's go look at those and see what patterns we can find in there. And uh, let's actually listen to the caller, interact with the IVR, so that we really understand why and how and where, you know, what was the specific failure mode? Um, what was the cause and, event and, and effect sequence, you know? Um, so we'd like to do that, and, and then if we could, we'd like to even go farther and, uh, and follow the call all the way out to the agent um, so that we could learn from the agent uh, more about the customer's behavior in the IVR. You know, frequently when the caller gets to the agent, um, in that dialogue with the agent, we discover what was in the caller's head. What were they trying to do? What was their intent? Um, and that is, and with that, with that new knowledge, we can go back and look at what happened in the IVR, and suddenly we understand why the customer was confused, uh, made certain choices um, uh, when you know they weren't the choices we would have wanted them to make. Um, the other thing we can learn from the agent is how the agent succeeds uh, at at things that the IVR failed to do. So if the IVR fails to collect uh, an account number, well, the agent's going to figure that out, and the agent might have some tricks some handling strategies to get that piece of information, and maybe we can take that trick and put it in the IVR flow. So there's a lot of value in uh, following calls after they leave the IVR to the agent and learning downstream uh, what then we could have done uh, earlier in the IVR. And so, you know, after doing this little project then, uh, we're hopefully in a position to summarize those findings and tell the organization about changes should we, we should make. And if we make those changes, uh, a specific forecast. You know, if we make these changes, 4% of our call volume is going to self-serve that's not self-serving today. So isn't, you know, this is fantastic. I mean, I think now we've got a plan here on how to go answer this question about uh, getting more self-service in the IVR. Of course, if you were uh, going after that second issue about frustration, you know, we could put a similar little work plan together. Um, you know, first of all, we need to get a list of calls where there's, you know, some frustration. We might be able to get a stack of surveys that have verbatims that indicate a problem. We might be able to get another report that lists, um, that, that indicates calls where uh, the customer actually verbalized complaints about the IVR to an agent. So we get, we get a list of calls, a set of calls that have some frustration. We pick a set to analyze them. And again, drill in, listen to the interaction, discover from the interaction where the points of difficulty are. Um, and follow those calls to the agent in order to get an even bigger picture. And, and, you know, and then we've got some understanding that we can bring to the, the, the solution strategy for improving satisfaction. Well, this seems all pretty straightforward. The problem is <laughs> um, when we try to go execute that plan, um, the data in the organization is frequently you know, incomplete. It's, uh, it's in various places. Um, we've got some log data in the IVR. Uh, we have some recordings of interactions with an agent, and we have some survey data. But trying to stitch all this together um, so that we can execute our little work plan is uh, frequently almost impossible. Um, and if we're going to do a little targeted project on, you know, 25 calls with failed self-service or 25 calls with evidence of frustration, how do you quickly get to just those calls? Or are we stuck with, um, you know, having to examine call after call after call, just trying to find one that has the attributes we want. So um, quickly getting to the calls that we need can be, you know, can be a big challenge. Uh, and then uh, even if we did that, actually listening to the calls in the IVR, you know, many of us, many organizations don't have the ability to get in the audio 
uh, which is where you know we're really going to learn a lot about what's going on. So that's that's the context for the demo. And what you're going to see is that with the Evoke system, we've built a capability to overcome those issues. And basically, the way we did it is we pushed analytics up into the cloud. Um, with and, and by being in the cloud, uh, we have a system now that can record the call uh, no matter where it goes, without any impact on any premise systems. Uh, we have a system now that's going to capture an end-to-end -end recording that's going to do speech and IVR analytics uh, on the entire call and uh, eliminate those obstacles uh, to, e to execute our little work plan and figure out uh, the key to getting more self-service. All right, so now you're probably saying, plenty of PowerPoints, Joe. I'm from Missouri. Show me what you're talking about, so let's get into the demo. Okay. So now you should be able to see uh, I'm actually in a web browser. This is the you know, main login screen for getting into the Evoke system. And I'll put in my credentials. And we'll jump right in. OK, um, so the system has come up. And uh, right away, it's presented me with uh, a dashboard. Um, you'll see that at the top, there are several major areas of the application. There's the dashboards, uh, the analysis workbench, a place where we can go listen to calls, where we can save things of interest. Uh, and on this dashboard, you can tell here we've got uh, the name of this dashboard. This dashboard is Call Reduction Opportunities. So this is a dashboard that was assembled specifically for a team that's trying to find opportunities to reduce Asian handled call volume. Uh, remember our scenario, though, uh, we want to go after uh, improving self-service. So I'm going to navigate through my list of all the available dashboards we have in the system, and I'm going to select one called Self-Service Diagnostics. Okay, so here's my Self-Service Diagnostics dashboard. And in this dashboard, we've got a bunch of interesting charts that help us understand uh, what's going on. Um, in the upper left, we have a, t a chart called Navigated to Self-Service. So this just shows us how many calls even show up at the self-service application. Uh, and we can see by each application here, um, what percent of inbound call volume you know, even arrives at the beginning of each of these self-service tasks. Um, and then on the upper right, we have a different view, which is um, of those calls that arrive at the self-service task, what percentage of them actually are successful in the task? So here's you know, two big issues around self-service. Are we getting the caller to the application, and once they get there, are they being successful? And just looking at these top two charts, you can get some pretty interesting stuff. I mean, if we look at the chart on the right, phone pay, that application is awesome. Every caller that gets into phone pay is successful. But if we go to the left, hardly anybody uses that app. It's less than 1% of callers even get there. Um, and by comparison, if we look at the balance app, that's the, you know, 10% of our call volume hits the balance app. But if we look at the right, only 50% of those callers actually fully self-serve. So this is a really interesting view because now we can focus our efforts on, you know, which, which of these two needles do we need to work on? Do we need to get more callers to the app, uh, the upper left, or do we need to make sure those callers get there uh, are actually successful? Um, what else do we have in this chart? Well, in the lower right, we've got self-service failures due to abandons. These are callers that actually hang up inside the self-service application. So they get in, invest some time, and then they say, forget it. And they don't, they don't even opt out. They just hang up the phone. On the left, we've got a chart that shows those that actually work in the application uh, and uh, are not successful and end up going out to an agent. Well, that's an interesting group, and that's a group we're going to go focus on. So in each of these charts, you can see this little link called Drill Down. I want to go dig into the self-service failure section, so we're going to hit that link and go uh, look at what's going on here in a little more detail. Now you can see that we've actually changed from the dashboard area of the application to the analysis page. Sometimes we call this the analysis workbench. And in the main area of the screen here, we've got that chart that we had originally uh, seen with all of the data. Um, and uh, we have on the left now a bunch of filters. We can see that 4,069 calls were, are in this view. And here's all the filters that were used to select uh, this set of calls. So it looks like call completion. These were calls that actually went to an agent. Uh, and under self-service, they did not self-serve. Uh, and it looks like they entered one of the following list of self-service applications. So this, this set of filters on the left we can use to control which you know, calls we want to view. So uh, that's a nice, handy feature. In this case, I think what we're going to do is we're going to go look at these pay-by-check calls. You know, that's a pretty interesting set of calls. Um, if people want to make a payment, you would hope we could actually do that easily. <laughs> and so uh, let me remove all the rest of the calls out of this view. 
Um, that's pretty simple. For example, under this self-service started area, I can remove the calls related to the balance application just by hitting that little red X, and the system is going to take those calls out of view and repaint that chart. Um, now, I could do that one at a time for each of these, but it might be easier to just open up that filter, uh, unselect all of the ones I don't want, check the ones I do want, and redraw the view. Okay, so now we're looking just at those calls that went into the pay-by-check application and failed. My column chart doesn't look very interesting anymore. You notice at the top we've got a few other charting tools so we can look at these calls by different attributes. For example, I might want to make this into a pie chart, and perhaps I'll want to look at the pie chart according to how many retries people had. Uh, that's pretty interesting. So it looks to me here that we've got you know, a large number of calls, maybe a third of the calls, uh, have three or more error prompts uh, in, you know, in, this, in the process of failing out of the application. Um, and, and we can actually, in this dropdown, uh, you know, we can uh, look at this set of calls by all kinds of different things, um, any different attribute you want. Um, we can also maybe go look at a different view. Here's the, um, the timing chart view. The timing chart view uh, shows me how much time a, the callers spend in yellow here. That's the time they spend in the IVR. So it looks like right now I'm moused over, you know, for, every, for all the calls that have a single error prompt, they spend almost three minutes in the IVR out of a seven-minute call. Then they spend, on average, a minute point uh, two uh, in the queue, and then they spend about three minutes uh, with an agent. So um, this is a really interesting view. What, what sort of jumped out at me right away is, uh, if you look at that bottom row, if there's a large number of error prompts, not only does that extend the time in the IVR, that makes sense, but it also extends the time with an agent. So it's a pretty interesting uh, situation here where um, a large number of errors in the IVR is actually uh, turning into, the, uh, those are the longer handle time calls. Uh, even more reason to go tackle this issue of uh, error prompts and figure out what in the world is going on. Okay, so now you've seen how we can use the panel on the left to select a set of calls and how we can use charting options to go navigate the data and understand uh, and learn some things about this set of failures. Um, sometimes the most interesting thing to do, though, is to actually jump down into a call and start looking at, uh, at what's going on. And so below this chart, uh, we have a list of all 488 calls that are currently in the view. Uh, and we can just pick one and go dig in and look at it. So now we are down into the call. And uh, let me take you uh, through briefly. Um, what our call listing screen looks like. So in yellow, we have the actual time. That's a waveform display that we're displaying at the top here. And the uh, upper half of the waveform display is audio coming from the IVR spoken to the caller. And the bottom half is the caller speaking back to the IVR. And that yellow portion then is the entire IVR portion of the call. All these little icons and things along the call are things that the system has automatically detected about the call or notes that we've added to the call to describe what's happening. After they leave the IVR, we have this little gray area. That's the time in queue. And then we have the green area. That's the agent conversation. So right away, we have here the true end-to-end, -end, start to finish you know, customer experience uh, with our contact center, with the IVR and with the agent side by side. On the look right below the waveform, we have a couple uh, regions of data. On the left, we have a bunch of metadata here, start time, duration, calling party number, et cetera. And on the right, we have an event stream which describes what happened in the call. There was a greeting, uh, and after the greeting, there was a how may I help you. And so you can see how that follows along. So to illustrate uh, what's going on in this call, remember, we're here because we're trying to discover uh, why this call failed out of self-service. So let's, uh, let's just start from the beginning and start listening and see if we can figure out uh, what's going on with this call. Hello, thank you for calling. For quality purposes, your call may be recorded. I am an automated assistant. How may I help you? Pay bill. Okay, well, that was a uh, um, you know obvious welcome prompt. Sounds like a nice, clear utterance. Pay bill. Uh, let's see what happens as we continue. By the way, you might have heard a little tone, and you'll see more of those with a little icon of a scissors in the shaded area. That's a feature we call data redaction, where the system takes out sensitive information and replaces it with a tone. It's part of kind of the security uh, 
features of a system like this to make sure that uh, sensitive data is masked and unavailable and to um, provide that extra measure of uh, data integrity and data privacy controls that we all have to deal with these days. So um, the customer said pay bill. Let's keep going and see what happened. Recent payments. Please hold hey, while I look up your accounts. All right, let's go back to that. So she said pay bill, and let's listen to that one more time. Pay bill. Account balance and recent payments. Please hold hey, while I look up your accounts. Are the last four numbers of your... Okay, so she said pay bill, and the system came back with kind of a confusing um, message. It wasn't clear if it was a retry message or a confirmation message. And so the caller waited for a moment and then tried to say pay bill again. And then the IVR stepped on her and interrupted her. And I don't know if you heard her response under her breath. She's like, oh, gosh. So she's kind of frustrated right away. The IVR is sort of interrupting and not interacting with her and kind of confusing her a little bit. Uh, and so uh, let's, let's keep going then and see what happens next. Account. Please hold hey, while I look at your accounts. Are the last four numbers of your account? No. Okay, now we have uh, you know, a situation where I think we've had a bad anti-match for some reason. The application has actually said, are the last four digits of your account uh, XYZ? And she says, no, those aren't the last four digits of my account. Um, so um, now we're going to have to go in and try to collect the account number. And uh, let's see what happens next. Sorry, my mistake. What's your account number? Okay, so we're prompted for the account number, and it's a, uh, a speech application, so we're going to try to collect it in speech. Let's jump to the end of those uh, you know, bleeped out tones that we've uh, hidden through data redaction. Let's go and see what happens after she provides that information. That number does not seem to be a valid or account number. Please enter your 11-digit account number using the, using the telephone keypad. All right, so she failed, uh, was unable to provide the account number successfully by speech, so we're going to default back to Dutch touch tone. Um, what actually happened there was she spoke only the last four digits of her account number. Um, she was coming off a failed anti-match where they tried to identify the account with only four digits, and so she thought that she should only have to speak four digits, and of course that didn't match. So there's some confusion there in the way that prompt is being understood, and we're having to default back to a... Uh, uh, a DTMF entry of her account number. She actually succeeds at DTMF entry of her account number, and then she moves on. And let's jump ahead a little bit and see what happens here. Your most recent payment posted on July 23rd, 2012 for $300. Please note that this does not include pending or scheduled payments. Would you like me to repeat that? No. Would you like to hear about the previous payments that have posted to your account? No. Okay, I don't know if you caught that, but we're now asking her questions. Would you like this? No. Would you like to hear something else? No. So she's kind of wondering, you know, I, I told you I want to pay my bill, and why is the IVR now taking me through all these other questions? In fact, in this particular area of the call, we're wasting our time. We're actually, after we know she wants to pay a bill, we're giving her a balance readout, we're giving her a readout of the last payment. We're asking her whether she'd like that information repeated. We're asking her if she wants to hear about previous payments. And then finally we ask, um, would you like to make a payment? To which she says, yes, that's what I said in the beginning. So here's an IVR you know, that has now, uh, rather than taking her right to make, paying her bill like she wants, wastes about 30 seconds on unneeded information readout that she didn't ask for and asking questions that really aren't relevant or needed for just um, you know, jumping ahead and, uh, and, and trying to pay her bill. So um, she's now a little frustrated because, you know, be, this adding to the frustration of uh, having the IVR step on her and the previous issues, um, and, you know, n now the IVR is wasting her time. So uh, at this point now, we're, the IVR is going to understand that we need to uh, pay by check, and so the IVR is going to jump ahead now and uh, instruct her to go get her checkbook so we can start collecting her routing number and her checking account number. Let's listen in on some of that. I'll just wait for a moment while you get your checkbook ready. When you're ready to continue, please press the pound sign. Wait a minute. No, I won't. 
Uh, you may be wondering what that little bleep was right before she says, wait a minute, that was an expletive. Uh, it's a word we can't say on television and didn't want to play here, but she's already cursing. Uh, and she says, you know, something, wait a minute, and let's keep going. No, I want my check. Okay. Okay, so she uh, found her checkbook and she says, okay, I'm ready. And let's see what happens now. Hello. Uh, okay, Javier, I want to move forward. Hello. <laughs> Javier is not coming back. So this is just continuing to be a great experience for her. Okay, please tell me your... All right, so we finally got back. So, um, you know, this is, you can see how this experience is just sort of adding to her. And uh, now we're going to move ahead. And here next in this part of the application, we ask for her bank routing number. Um, and uh, we ask for it first in speech. And uh, that actually fails. And uh, then we jump ahead and we do DTMF entry of the uh, routing number. And we actually get the routing number correctly uh, uh, by this point in the application. Uh, and now that we have the routing number, um, we move ahead to the account number. Uh, let's just peek in on that. Okay, please tell me your checking account number. The account number is the next set of numbers in the lower left-hand corner of your check, just before the check. All right, so she uh, speaks her checking account number, and uh, here's what she gets back. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Please key in your checking account number using... All right, so this is starting to get a, be a pattern in this, in this call. We uh, first prompt in speech for a bunch of digits, and we fail out of speech, and we fall back to DTMF data entry. So she's had another sort of, I'm sorry, I didn't get that, retry. And now the system asks for her um, account number, but now uh, it's instructing her to do it in touchtone. Uh, let's see how this works out. Using your telephone keypad. Is that correct? All right, so you heard some tones. That's uh, her providing some touch tones. And then she's pausing because she's um, trying to follow the number on her check. And uh, the IVR incorrectly thinks that's the end. So it plays back a couple of digits and just asks if that's correct. And of course, she kind of ignores that and keeps going. So we've got some turn taking stuff going on here. Uh, and, at the, and at the end of when she's done providing digits, uh, here's what happens next. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. I heard. No. Is that correct? So it plays back, the, you know, the IVR, since it's had some turn-taking problems, only collects a couple of digits, and it plays back only two or three digits as her account number, and her response was, uh, of course that's not the right answer. You can hear this again when she says, no. Let's hit that one more time. Heard. No. Is that correct? There it is. It's, she pressed zero. That's it. Uh, you know, this is where she's timed out. She has now spent four minutes in the IVR. She's had a bunch of unproductive exchanges, and she hits the zero and says, I'm done. Let me out. I need to go talk to an agent. So remember, we were trying to understand um, what it was about uh, this call that failed uh, self-service. And I think we're starting to get a picture of what's going on. Um, First of all, this application is insisting on using speech recognition to collect digits, and it's not doing a good job of it. It, it consistently fails to collect digits using speech and then falls back to DTMF. In fact, uh, one could easily conclude that if we just uh, preferred uh, touch tone for digit collection, uh, this caller may have had success. We may have been able to actually keep this call in the IVR uh, if we uh, chose a, an input method that was uh, a, frankly, a better fit for, num for numeric data. DTMF works great for numeric data, and as we can see here, uh, uh, not so much for speech. So she zeroes out, and uh, let's hear what happens next. Please hold while I transfer your call. Thank you. This call. I don't know if you caught that, but she decided to say thank you to the IVR. She pressed zero, and the IVR says, okay, we'll transfer you. And she says, thank goodness uh, for letting me out. So now she's going to move ahead, and uh, you can see we, we have a very short queue in gray. Uh, we hit green. Um, and uh, the first thing that the agent is going to do is, well, let's find out. Thank you for calling 
My name is Barbara. May I have our account number, please? Um. Okay, well, that's unfortunate. Uh, the agent says, uh, may I have your account number? Well, we actually struggled through that in the IVR. We collected that in the IVR, uh, and the first thing the agent's going to do is ask for data that the, uh, that the customer's already provided. Um, this, by the way, is one of the top uh, dissatisfiers that people report about customer, status, customer service, and that is having to provide the same information over and over again. Um, if we keep playing here, we're going to hear um, the caller uh, express a few more thoughts about what she thinks about the automated system. So let's continue with that. Um, count number. Okay. Um, it's 11 I'm having a terrible time trying to make a payment here. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. So two things there. First of all, she's like, I'm having an awful time just trying to make a payment. So she's clearly not happy. The other thing that I thought was sort of interesting is the agent says, may I have your account number? And she's struggling for a minute. Okay, um, which number? Um, and I'm supposed to an agent, um, this might be sort of confusing. I mean, uh, the agent made a very clear request, may I have your account number? And, and for some reason, that's confusing to the caller. And of course, the reason it's confusing to the caller is the caller has just spent um, four minutes in the IVR trying to provide an account number, a routing number, a checking account number. She's had a series of successes or failures, and now she's trying to get reset about which number it is that the agent wants. So all of this is really contributing to lengthening out um, the time it's going to take this agent to handle this call. Um, so they're going to uh, exchange the number, and then um, uh, the caller is going to make another comment here on the whole experience. Seven, nine. What okay. happened to the personal people you talked to? Uh, uh, now, there you know, there she is. What's happened to the people you used to talk to? Not like in uh, the automated system at all. Uh, and so, you know, this is adding to the time that the agent has to spend dealing with this particular call. And um, and we're going to keep moving on. Then she's going to go through some required uh, script that she has to go through for this kind of a call later on here. Uh, she's going to actually collect the routing number. Uh, here's another piece of information uh, that was already collected in the IVR, but uh, she's going to ask for it all over again. And, uh, and then finally, uh, here later on in the call, we're going to have confirmation that the call was successful. All right, so this is pretty interesting, and I think um, you'll all uh, agree, we've learned a lot about this call by actually being able to listen to the interaction. We've got a lot more richness of what's going on here and how callers are interacting with this process flow and with the IVR system because we can hear the interaction. It's not a test caller. It's not one of our IVR team actually placing a call who knows the app too well, and therefore, you know, it works perfectly for them every time. This is a real live customer. Uh, in summary, what happened in this particular call was, um, you know, we had a bunch of misrecognitions. In each case, um, the misrecognitions were caused by trying to collect numeric data using speech recognition instead of DTMF. We had a failed anti match, and we tried to do an anti confirmation with four digits. Immediately after, we asked for the account number, and so the customer thought four digits was enough. So there was a mistaken queue um, where we didn't tell the customer that, okay, now we want the full ac account number. Um, we had an IVR application which wasted 33 seconds of the customer's time on unneeded information and unnecessary questions uh, getting in her way of moving forward and being able to uh, pay the bill. Um, we had an IVR that was designed to use the pound sign to indicate that you have found your checkbook, but apparently couldn't understand that it should also respond to the phrase, okay, or hello, as alternative signals that you found the check checkbook and you want to move forward. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, we have a total of four minutes of IVR time, which is not an atypical sort of fatigue period where customers say, that's about enough with an automated system, especially if I don't feel like I'm making a progress. Um, then we have an agent that spends 55 seconds of her time uh, with the customer collecting information that was already collected in the IVR. Uh, and, uh, and we have in total here a six and a half minute agent call that really wasn't necessary. Um, uh, and so, you know, lots of opportunities uh, in this call alone. Um, information that we've gleaned here in 10 or 15 minutes um, from just being able to see the agents and the IVR together and being able to sort of work through the audio that we're, we're not never going to get that richness of understanding looking at the pieces and parts of data that we have if it's just IVR logs 
which we can't necessarily connect to the following agent recording. And so hopefully that, you know, the power of this full view has become evident in this particular call. Now let's go back, and of course we could now just keep going um, and click through a bunch of calls. And uh, by looking at a bunch of calls, we would start collecting a little library of which of these problems occur frequently and uh, which ones are the most important ones to go work on. Um, now I've selected another call in this set because this call has another interesting set of attributes. Um, one jumps at, out at you right away when you look at the colors. Uh, remember the, in the waveform, yellow was IVR. This, this customer encountered two IVRs um, or two sessions with the IVR. We can see a short session with the IVR in the beginning, followed by a, uh, a, queue, a queue time, uh, and then the first agent, and then another bunch of time with the IVR, another short queue, and a second agent. Um, this is another um, self-servable call. Had the IVR done the right thing, this call could have been contained in the IVR. Instead, it turned into two agent-handled calls. This first one is 52 seconds, the second one is 137 seconds. So here the IVR is actually multiplying and generating agent-handled call volume. We're not only failing to self-serve the call, but we're turning it into two agent-handled calls instead of one uh, because of sort of the, the problems that exist in this call. Now, we can, um, uh, just like we did last time, we can work through this call and, and discover some, you know, start to discover the root causes for this. Maybe the first thing we'd want to understand is why in the world did the um, uh, first IVR uh, end so abruptly and not get very far into the flow? Um, so let's, let's actually go take a look at that and see if we can discover um, what happened. So we'll, we'll jump ahead, we'll skip the opening greeting and uh, start listening to uh, what's going on in this IVR. How may I help you? Pay my bill. Pay by phone? Pay by phone. So that was an interesting exchange. You may not have even been able to hear the caller. It was really muffled, kind of low, and yet the recognizer got it. Pay your bill, yes. Pay by phone, yes. Pay by, you know, so we, we actually were moving along really nicely here. Um, it was working very well. So let's keep going and see uh, what went south. Please hold while I look up your accounts. Okay, what account number are you calling about? That's a bit of an awkward flow uh, for a failed anti-match, but nonetheless, uh, we're now asking for the customer to um, tell us their account number so we can proceed. Uh, let's see what happens. Oh, boy. Uh, Please hold while I try. So, um, again, the caller has kind of low amplitude in their phone, um, but the caller says, oh, boy, let me see. Um, this caller is just trying to find uh, their account number, and the IVR immediately says, okay, let me transfer you. So, so you know, again, uh, what's going on here? I mean, we're trying to collect a numeric account number, um, and the caller says, oh, boy. Um, in all likelihood, the IVR misrecognized that as I don't have it or something like that and decided to jump the caller out. It's a premature ejection of the caller from the self-service application because of a misrecognition. So there's the reason why um, the first IVR fails to uh, actually self-serve this call. Um, now we can jump ahead and uh, see what else is going on uh, and let's uh, actually jump into the agent conversation uh, and find out what's going on. There's an interesting location there. Uh, let's see, uh, that would be right about here. Check is free. Okay, I'll pay with the check first. Hold on. Okay, so um, talks with the agent and says that he would like to pay by check. There's kind of a long period of inaction here, and um, the agent says, hold on, and here's what happens after uh, a little while. Please hold while I look up your accounts. Okay, what account number are you calling about? Okay, well, that's familiar. If you remember the first IVR right here, let's play that again. Please hold while I look up your accounts. Okay, what account number are you calling about? And here's where the caller ended up after the agent said, uh, hold on a minute. Please hold while I look up your accounts. Okay, what account number are you calling about? Ah, okay, now we can see exactly what happened. The reason why the agent went silent 
is the agent essentially redialed the toll-free number, navigated the first few menus for the caller, and then dumped the caller into the IVR right at the beginning of that very same payment application that the caller failed out of the first time. So that's probably not the best way to handle that call, um, uh, certainly because it was an unannounced sort of blind transfer back into the IVR. Uh, but regardless, we're, we're right back in the IVR, and uh, we're going to now try to do some things. And uh, similar to the first call, what happens here is we, we have a speech prompt for the account number, uh, which fails. And so then we move on and we do a successful DTMF capture of the account number. Uh, and then we do a balance readout. Um, and then after the balance readout, we're going to uh, try to collect the routing number. And we're actually going to have a, uh, a failed uh, speech attempt to collect the routing number. So we're going to uh, then change back to DTMF. And we're going to attempt a DTMF collection of the account number. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, at the end of the DTMF collection of the um, routing number, I'm sorry, um, here's what happens. Please hold while I transfer your call. So this was sort of odd. Um, if we uh, you know, looked at this call closely, we'd see that this was actually a trouble-free, uh, looked like it was correct, no indication of problems, uh, DTMF entry of a routing number. And with no explanation, the IVR announces, OK, let me transfer you. Um, so it's kind of puzzling. Uh, it's not entirely clear why we exited the IVR at that point. Um, and here's the case where if we proceed on in the call, um, we're going to learn a few more things that might help us understand what's going on here. Um, so let's jump ahead and uh, see what happens next. Good morning. Thank you for calling. This is Terry. Can I please have your account number? My, what do you want, the routing number or the account number? Your account number. Okay, so here's that same problem again. You know, the agent makes a seemingly very simple question, uh, request, can I have your account number? And the customer's response is, which number do you want? And, and again, I'm sure to an agent it's like, why don't these people understand when I just asked for their account number? And the answer is because they've struggled through two IVRs and they've been dealing with account numbers and checking account numbers and routing numbers, and they're, you know, trying to get their place now about where they're supposed to be. Um, so, you know, this again, all of this struggle with these two prior IVR sessions is contributing to lengthening out the time it's going to take this agent to handle this call. Um, and of course, the other point uh, is that the agent's asking for an account number, which we already got successfully in the IVR, so that's a little confusing. Um, and this agent's actually going to spend 20 seconds collecting the account number, which was successfully collected already in the IVR. Uh, and then the agent's going to ask how I can help you, which of course we already know, uh, because we got that earlier. The, both IVRs and the agent, uh, you know, understand the reason for the call, but that's not available to the second agent. Um, and now we get to a point where it gets pretty interesting again, uh, and let's see what happens here. Uh, the caller says uh, they want to pay their bill, and uh, here's what the agent says in response. Okay, give me just a moment. I'll go ahead and get that system ready to process the payment for you. I made a tell and they tell me I'm pushing the wrong buttons. Could you take the payment yourself, please? I will definitely help you. All right, let's take that again. That was sort of an interesting interchange. Okay, give me just a moment. I'll go ahead and get that system ready to process the payment for you. So I made a tell and they told me I'm pushing the wrong buttons. Could you take the payment yourself, please? I will definitely help. All right, she says, uh, just a moment while I set up uh, the system, get the system ready to process the payment for you. He knows what that means is, uh, you're going to throw me back in the IVR, and he says, no, 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 the automated teller keeps telling me I'm pushing the wrong buttons. Please take the payment yourself. Uh, and so she agrees, and we move on, and she actually collects uh, uh, the information, um, the account number, and finishes the payment, and we have a successful payment. All right, so here's the um, sort of bottom line on this call. Um, why did this fail self-service twice, by the way? We attempted self-service in the IVR twice, the first time because – Again, we were using speech to try to collect an account number instead of DTMF. We misracked the customer fumbling around looking for their account number and kicked them out of the IVR uh, prematurely. Um, when we got back into the IVR the second time, uh, we provided a routing number and were kicked out of the IVR without really an explanation. By the way, if we looked at the routing number interchange here in the, IVR, in the agent conversation, we would find that the um, agent asked for the routing number, the caller gave it, it was perfect, it was clean. The caller gave the agent the exact same routing number that the, uh, that the caller DTMF'd into the IVR. 
So there's something strange going on there. You know, one would have to go a little deeper now to say, well, why did the IVR reject an, a routing number that it correctly uh, collected uh, and that the agent was able to use, but still the IVR threw the caller out of the app? You know, it could be that it was a failed database lookup. It could be a correct data table somewhere, but there's definitely something more there to look into. Um, so in summary, for this call, um, a series of misrecognitions, um, a series of occasions where agents are asking for information that's previously been collected, um, uh, the second agent spending 20 seconds collecting data that's already been collected, um, and one call that should have been self-served in this case turned into two agent handled calls, one 52 seconds, another 137 seconds. So um, I, I hope what you've seen in the course of going through this demo is that when we can start at a dashboard uh, that shows us something like self-service failures, and in a couple of clicks, um, hit a chart, uh, and then slice the chart the way we want, and after slicing the chart the way we want, get right down to a call, do a little listening, and understand a lot about what's happening in these calls, I mean, this is far more productive in just 20 or 30 minutes than the, you know, extensive exercise that it usually takes to dig up data, try to clean it, try to align it, uh, et cetera. And uh, that's really um, the power of this end-to-end -end analytics solution and, uh, you know, what we wanted to share with you today. Uh, essentially, what we provide, uh, you know, is analytics without the pain of what we've all come to expect with analytics solutions. And uh, we do it in the Evoke system by pushing analytics essentially up into the phone network. So there's nothing at your premise. There's no software to install. There's no integration. In fact, all of your systems, to you, all of your systems, it just looks like another inbound phone call. It's like we're, you know, something that your carrier is doing for you. And so everything just works. And, um, and since we're in the network, we have this unique perspective to get the whole call through all those transitions. Uh, IVR that might be hosted. These demo calls were actually from an environment where the IVR is hosted by one of the big toll-free providers, um, and then the call comes to a prem. It could have another transfer, another transfer. Um, in our application, you actually have the whole thing, um, which enables you to do this kind of uh, powerful analysis and um, root cause understanding, in this case, of uh, how to improve self-service. So with that, I think we've gone a little long for the presentation portion. I apologize for that. I hope that was interesting. Um, and I would like now to um, ask Sherry if we've got any questions, and maybe we can turn to a little bit of a Q&A session. Thank you, Joe. Great presentation. Uh, yes, for those of you that you're seeing everything in full screen, to get to the Q&A section, look at the console. You'll see a tab kind of floating at the top, and it says Viewing Joe Alwyn's Desktop. If you just Put your mouse over it, the, that little floating will come down and you'll see Q&A and that's where you can, a little box will pop up, put your questions in there. I see a couple of people have found that because we do have a couple of questions. Here we go. The charts you showed in the beginning of the demo looked really interesting. How hard is that to create? Um, oh, they're really simple actually. Um, as you saw when we got into the chart of the calls, um, it was very straightforward to uh, slice and dice those calls differently. In fact, um, uh, Sherry, if I can just pop back into the application, hope that's all right, um, we'll go right back to the analysis uh, uh, screen. And, and I think you saw how we were able to um, use these filters on the left to point and click and select the calls we want. And once we have the calls we want, we could use a few other point and click options to create the chart we want. And if we have a chart that we like, we can now bookmark this chart, save it, and then add it to a dashboard. So it's all, uh, it's very interactive. It's something you do as a user. There's no sort of separate report writer. You don't have to submit a request to somebody to go figure out the SQL query. I mean, it's all point and click right there in the environment. Um, you know, configuring charts by uh, using the panels on the left to select calls, using the charting options to get the view you want, and then save the chart. It's really that simple. Do you think there are benefits uh, to the system in a sales call center with very little self-service? Um, absolutely. And, and, and in fact, in sales call centers, um, we've helped customers solve a number of problems. Um, uh, you know, in many sales centers, uh, every call is a lead. And so uh, sales centers get really interested and very excited to understand what's happening to all our calls. Um, and, you know, why am I getting calls that are not sales leads wasting my time? And if I'm getting calls that are not sales leads, then are there any sales calls that are going somewhere else? 
And so a lot of sales organizations are really concerned about, especially if you have one toll-free number for the whole organization, that first menu, which is supposed to peel off the sales calls and give them to the sales department and peel off the tech support calls and give them to somebody else, is that working? Um, and so for a sales organization, the fact that you can give them complete visibility of that process flow, they can begin to see, okay, I understand why you know, um, we're getting some non-sales calls. Let's go fix that. Um, I can see that, you know, there's, that there may be tech support calls that legitimately turn into sales calls. So the whole flow of how, how calls get into the sales organization, whether there are sales lead calls that somehow don't get to the sales organization, um, or if the sales organization transfers calls to somewhere else, all of that becomes visible and understandable uh, with an application like this. Okay, let's see. How do you report when the IVR is not speech but DTMS? Oh, that's actually a great a question, and it's uh, very straightforward. So um, if we go back to the uh, uh, call view, um, what we have in this view of the call is a bunch of uh, detected events. And uh, let's see, were there any uh, in this particular one as we flip through this view? There we go. Um, uh, right now, if you can see, I'm highlighting a, an event called press uh, the pound sign. So the system automatically detects all DTMF tones. So it'll detect digits, the pound sign, the star key, and those become events in the stream here. So in a, a DTMF system, you'll actually see prompts, you'll see digit presses, um, all, all laid out here. In fact, in this particular call, if we didn't have the sensitive data removal, the data redaction operating, you would actually see digit presses according to the account numbers. If you recall, we had a failed speech entry followed by a successful DTMF entry. If we didn't have the data protection uh, uh, going, you would actually see the digit presses for the account number they put in. So um, the system works uh, equally well you know, for DTMF, for speech, any kind of speech. Um, you still you still get all the power of you know what we've what we've shown today. Let's see our next question: How do you address privacy questions related to your access to customer information? Right. So, um, great question. And it, you know, it's a cloud application. So this is running in our data center, which means that our system has recordings of your calls uh, and your customers and the information they're providing. So we certainly encounter this. Uh, this question, and we have this conversation with every company that we work with. Um, I will point out that our customers include some of the largest computer manufacturers, uh, PC manufacturers, um, in fact, the largest uh, PC and smartphone manufacturer, um, uh, large carriers, and all of these companies have healthcare companies. So, you know, we've gone through the security screening to make sure that we handle PCI, payment card industry information correctly. We handle HIPAA, healthcare information correctly. And it's a variety of things. Part of it is this little you know, scissors you see in the call, which is the way that our system automatically removes sensitive information from calls. So that the information, the call that we've stored, has a, a bleep over the top of where the customer might have said their credit card number. Um, the other way we handle that question is we have an extensive um, administrative, organizational, and technical controls that manage the security of our environment. Everything from criminal background checks for people that work for us to 24-hour guards on site to the levels of encryption we need, you know, we frequently go through all of that to give our customers the assurance that um, this is a cloud application that uh, certainly doesn't put your information at any more risk than it would if you had it in your own data center. Okay, let's see. Currently, we're not able to listen to the IVR portion of our calls. Would this system still have a way to get to that portion of the call? Oh, absolutely. And, and, and this is the wonderful thing. Um, uh, that's you know, one of the huge additions that this provides uh, uh, all of our customers is the ability to listen inside the IVR. Um, just like in the calls that we showed, this, this yellow portion, this is recording inside the IVR, and the Evoke system is doing the recording. So we don't rely on any of your equipment to do recording. So it, you don't have to turn on logging in your IVR. You don't have to reconfigure your quality system to you know, uh, record before the switch instead of after. Um, none of that. There's n you do nothing to your current setup. We simply uh, insert the call browser system in your architecture. We basically become the man in the middle. We're kind of in between um, you and your call center. And if we go back to the uh, slide presentation, um, you can see here on the left, your customer places a phone call 
that call traverses the phone network and lands on your contact center. When we're in the picture, um, that call, while it's in the phone network, passes through my data center. So I'm sitting here in between your customer and you recording, which means I'm recording everything. I'm recording the rings as the call arrives at your switch. I'm recording the IVR that you provide, experience you provide, the transfer, the star eight, the queue messages, the queue music, the first agent, the transfer to your agents in India, back to your, your agents in Arizona. I mean, the whole thing. And that's because uh, we're doing recording as a net, in, in the phone network, not at a premise. And so uh, we're going to give you a recording of everything, uh, the entire call as the customer experienced it from the moment they dialed your phone number until the moment they hung up. Okay, let's see. How does the data redaction we heard in these calls work? Well, there are um, uh, uh, techniques we've built to analyze the audio of the call and identify where sensitive information is being exchanged. And uh, when we identify those locations, uh, we overwrite the audio uh, with a pattern that is just a, a bleep, uh, you know, a tone. Um, and so our system uses a variety of technologies to locate these sensitive data interchanges. Um, we, we use some uh, patented and proprietary um, audio signature matching technology to locate events at the call. These can be prompts, messages, digits. Uh, and then we use um, a sort of a pattern uh, analysis to say, okay, when you see the following series of events, that is the exchange of a credit card number. Uh, and so we have that pattern recognition, we have the events that we can use. And then we also have underneath uh, this recording, we have a full text transcript of the call. We actually have a, a recognizer uh, basically a speech analytics recognizer, and, and in the speech analytics, we can also spot uh, uh, clues that tell us um, that the agent or the IVR has just asked the customer for their street address or uh, something like that. So we have a variety of techniques to locate uh, in the call the exchange of sensitive information, and then once we've located it, you know, we can automatically overwrite that and make sure that the sensitive information is never stored in our servers, can't be played back by anybody, it's completely wiped out and not there anymore. Okay. Uh, Joe, we're getting a couple more calls. I'd like to stay over the hour a little bit, if that's okay with you, just to get all our calls in. Is that is that fine? Oh, absolutely. Okay, then let's take that next call. Is there a way to perform ad hoc search for certain phrases being said during the call? Um, ad hoc search for phrases. Oh, absolutely. In fact, um, uh, I can kind of show you a little bit about that. We didn't demo that particular feature, but if I go back to the analysis workbench, um, uh, on the left, remember, these are all the filters that allow us to select calls. Um, and the very first filter says what? It says full text search. I can open that filter and I can put a phrase in here. So, um, you know, uh, credit card number. And now I can go search for calls uh, where, where that phrase was, was spoken. Or maybe even a better one, uh, you people. You know, that's a good phrase to find uh, callers that are upset. So, um, and we can do Booleans in here, so we can put ex complex expressions in here. Uh, and you can type in anything you want. And, that, and that's actually going to search a full text transcript of the call to return just those calls that have that phrase. And then there's this little pattern of boxes below here. Um, this is pretty interesting because here I can control what portion of the call we're going to search for that phrase. So, for example, if I just check this upper, the, the rows, let me just uh, explain the matrix. The rows are the speaker. So the top row is things said by the customer. The bottom row is things said by the company. And the column then is the part of the call. Is it the IVR segment of the call? Is it the Q segment of the call? Or is it the agent interaction segment of the call? So, um, you know, if I put you people and I check this upper right box, I'm looking for times where the caller says you people while they're speaking with an agent. That's it. Uh, instead, if I uh, check the first box, that's the customer saying you people while they're in the IVR. So I can focus this search on an individual speaker and on an individual, you know, on a certain region of the call, and I can use these searches to, you know, help me select um, a set of calls that I'm really interested in. This next question uh, is dealing with third-party vendors. So if a call is 
transferred to a third party vendor, for example, to make a payment, would that portion of the call be recorded also even though it's outside of the company? Oh, definitely. And that's really another one of the huge applications of the system. Um, you know, our some of our biggest and, and you know, customers we offer just incredible value is for companies that can, you know, for the first time see inside the IVR and for the first time follow those calls out to an agent where you really, you know, the truth about an IVR is not in your log data. It's in the audio of the interaction in the IVR, and it's, and it's in what happened with the agent later. So IVR is one of the big areas of focus. Another huge area of focus is companies that want to be able to better manage vendor partners and business partners and want to understand what is the brand experience after I transfer my call to that partner. And, and can I have a view of that end-to-end -end process, including the partner, um, so I don't have to rely just on the partner's reports that they give me about what a good job they're doing. I can actually observe, listen, and understand what that interaction is like. So, uh, in, in fact, we had a customer who um, transferred payment calls to a third party, and, and they felt that the third party was um, sending way too many calls back to them. Um, and uh, and couldn't understand why. Well, with our system, they found out that the payment provider was was providing horrible financing terms, and none of the customers who went to the partner were willing to take the, the terms of the uh, payment plans that they offered. And so every call was going to the partner. It was pointless. There's no reason to even transfer the calls to that partner because the payment plans they offered were so ridiculous. And so based on that understanding, they actually terminated the relationship. So, yeah, you can... In this way, you can use this capability to, you know, mystery shop, if you will, um, your partners and see how they're handling your calls. And perhaps more importantly, see how that partner handling fits in the overall dialing to hang up experience that the customer has. And for our last call, there's a couple of questions here on implementation. So if you can just address how long it takes for implementation, how long till they start receiving some actionable data? Sure, absolutely. And for that, we'll flip back to the PowerPoints for a moment. Um, uh, let's see here. Let me get that back on the screen. There we go. Um, so the implementation is pretty straightforward. Um, as, as this picture sort of illustrates, um, we have to get a, a sample of your call volume uh, to come through my data center instead of being delivered directly to you. And so this is done with routing rules that you establish with your long distance provider, your toll free provider. So this first little um, arrow that drops down uh, into the evoke system, basically what you do is you, you add a termination to your toll free number. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. Um, I'm sure all of you have contacted AT&T, Verizon, whoever you use for toll free and said, hey, I need a new termination or let's add a termination or maybe you use Routed and you can provision new terminations yourself. So, you know, that can happen, you know, in a day or two. You can set up a new termination that points to the Evoke data center and now you can person allocate. You can say, put all of my calls through Evoke, put 5% of my calls through Evoke and we can work with you to figure out, you know, for your needs, do you need to put all of your volume through the system? Can you put a fraction of the volume through your system? So, you know, that's a really simple first start of the process is to get calls into the Evoke system. Now we need to get those calls to you. That's the back half. That's the, the, the upward arrow, upward, you know, little blue line here. This is the second half of the implementation process. And for that, you give me a number to dial so that I can get those calls back into your network. Um, and usually um, you just clone your toll-free number and you give me a special number that I can dial, that my system can dial to get that call back in your, in, your, in your call volume. And so that's it. We have two things we have to do. We've got to add a termination to our toll-free number, and we've got to clone your existing toll-free number so that I can use it to get those calls back into your environment. So that whole process, setting up those two things, two, three weeks, uh, if your carrier is really slow, maybe four weeks at the most. Uh, so in the matter of um, actually one to three, one to four weeks, that provisioning has been installed. We've helped you uh, set the parameters for that, place the orders for it, test it to make sure it's working, and the system's running. Um, so that's it. That's, a, that's the whole implementation process. And then um, once calls are actually flowing in the system, uh, it'll take us a couple days to set up the um, uh, charts and graphs and the, and the categorization rules that create all those pretty charts that you saw. So it's, you know, it's a really fast process. Um, it, it goes very quickly. Great. And if you want to go right to your next slide, which has your contact information. You bet. 
And it looks like we did cover, oh, another question came in. <laughs> Disaster recovery, anything like that built in, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, no problem. Um, and, and thank you for everybody that stuck around. I can see we've got a large crowd still with us, and I very much appreciate that. So disaster recovery. Um, yeah, of course, you know, our data center has all the things you might expect uh, for disaster recovery. I mean, redundancy in the systems, redundancy in the networking components, an on-site generator, on-site fuel storage, you know. Um, so all those things you do to make sure that as a data center, uh, we have maximize uptime, minimize disruptions. Um, on the other hand, let's let's you know say the worst case scenario. Uh, you know all of Boston went dark for an extended period of time, and the generator ran out of power. So what happens in the uh, absolute worst possible case? Well, most of our customers, when they set up that branch that's going to divert calls to me, um, they put busy handling on that termination. So if for some reason I disappear entirely, those calls are going to be automatically rerouted directly to your center. So um, essentially, there's no chance. Um, that your customer's experience, that their ability to reach you is going to be disrupted. I'm either going to take that call, handle it, and it's going to be successful, or if for some reason I'm not there, which, you know, this is the sort of second or third level disaster recovery, then the phone network is going to automatically say, oh, um, uh, that termination isn't there. Let me pull the call back and send it on directly to the center. So, you know, we handle disaster recovery um, in, in a fashion that ensures that your customer's contact experience won't be disrupted uh, in the remote event that something's going to happen. And uh, obviously, um, we want to take the call. We want to give you the service. Otherwise, we're not going to be in business. So we have, you know, done all the normal stuff to our data center uh, to ensure that we maximize uptime. So those are, those are really the primary strategies around disaster recovery. Perfect. And at this time, we will be closing down the webcast. Um, anything, any final thoughts you'd like to tell everybody? Well, no. I, seconds. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to thank everybody for spending some of their Friday with us. And, uh, you know, if we've shown you something that's interesting, um, please reach out. Uh, we'd love to do a more focused demo around your specific needs, answer under, other questions. And um, um, thank you, Sherry, for organizing this. Uh, we love working with you and Serum Exchange. And uh, thank you, everybody else, for uh, joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Joe. This is a great demo. You're getting lots of awesome as comments, so it was great. <laughs> and just as a reminder, this we will send everybody a link to the recording on Monday. So you'll have that, and you can show it to anybody else you'd like in your organization. Thanks again to Joe Alwyn and Evoke Analytics. Thank you to everybody that has spent your Friday at the hour with us. We always appreciate that. And at this point, we will be ending this demo. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Bye now. Bye now.